Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mokalover, and thank you for joining me back here in TNO, the Lassies of Europe, in which we are paying them enough. The German garrison in Cornwall is for the most part well trained, well disciplined, and ruthlessly efficient, but every army has its weak links. In the case of the garrison down there, it would appear that many of the lower ranking officers are of dubious loyalty to the vaunted Vaterland, and are more than open to taking bribes in return for looking the other way in regards to certain actions. The stealing of equipment and not patrolling a section of the beaches for an hour or two. Truly, the revolution has no greater ally than the incompetence of those ideologically F-word dudes. We will render the garrison in Cornwall a lackluster ally to the traitor king. Here is hoping he quakes in the boots when he realizes it. Actually, did I do this already? I think I did. Cool. I made sure that we kept boosting up more and more cells all over the place. Oh, yes, please. Uh, of course. And pay them enough, of course. But we must follow through and remove the rest. Sometimes it pays to be direct. For every officer willing to take a bribe, there exists one who represents the peak of Germanic efficiency. As such, Alexander has formulated a solution to the problem. We just shoot them. Well, just not just shoot them. Bombs. Car accidents. You know, accidental doses of cyanide in the sauerkraut. Maybe a fake... Uh, S word or three. In the end, as long as they die, we won't question how. Perhaps it might be prudent just to make a few vanish all right and scare the more cowardly into deserting. It's a problem solved at any rate. So I'm saying uh, Alkinlex should be very happy about indeed. Yeah, I don't know. Can you say that S word at the beginning of the first few minutes of the video? I don't know. I don't know, man. Mm. Yeah. Kind of touchy subjects, but followed up with Operation Franz. Franz Halder is a man who holds England in an iron grip. His Cornwall garrison enforces the will of the Reich, and it's well past time that he paid for his crime. We won't, likely won't get an opportunity to try him, so it's just been decided that assassinating him works just as well. In this case, any blowback we receive will be well worth the wait, and the man in his inner circle are irre irreplaceable officers, and doubly so, for the familiarity with England. The plan itself has a few point of failures as possible. We intend to be in and out before the garrison, much less than the collaborations government, is aware anything has ever happened. We won't likely get a second chance to repeat this attempt, so... It, of course, since it will put the garrison in higher alert for months. We can only wish the assigned men the best of luck. Nice. And Gloucestershire... We'll do that too. Still looking okay. Not too worried about it until the first of the month, so not enough time. Time is something that is not on our side. The collaboration of government is well this too. While we have stymied the best attempts to root us out thus far, each day that passes, more guns produced, more men recruited, more of our cells discovered. Alkenlach, Sterling, and Alexander have conferred with each other. The time is now. The war of liberation, of revolution, of revenge, a war for the free England, for a better England. For all of England, the men and, men, win, uh, the men and women willing to take up arms for a cause are ready. We only wait the word to strike our foes. Perhaps one day those will be remembered in a song. We can only hope that that song isn't a sad one. And it is soon be time for the uprising to begin we should have until november 1st for the thing to uh, for us to do well so actually i'm just gonna keep doing this then uh, unless we need anything else down here at the bottom looking good we don't need any more guns we're looking pretty good here and this is for london east anglia sussex places that we don't really need to do any of that stuff so we'll just do this one because we get one more monthly tick six and a half is pretty extreme and we'll do stability there because we can because it's already pretty much maxed out you know what this is actually looking i think Pretty much the same, maybe slightly better than when I did this off-screen by myself. But this is looking, I'll be honest, pretty darn good, not gonna lie. I hope you guys think this looks pretty good. I think this looks pretty good myself. I love blue. Uh, this is not my favorite shade of blue, but blue is still pretty good. Anyways, we got a lot of comments to go through. Um, government mission to Newcastle. Oh, London is still 54%, which is actually that's pretty good. These guys should flip to us by the end of the month, as long as we get there, because we need to get this one done first. Improved motorized equipment looks very nice. And London, or the UK, or I guess just England. We love our little tractors. Our little thingamabobs. Our trucks. Why can I think of that T-word, trucks? Anyways, um, someone recommends that we bring back the Queen no matter what. Well, we can try. We will try. Eventually, we will hopefully get the Queen back. Uh, someone recommends we go with Jellicoe and rebuild the Navy. Or the Royal Navy, of course. Someone recommends we go instead Levantine Kingdom. Will Arabs and Jews ever get along? Probably not. And, very nice. Uh, someone also recommends that we go libertarian. So actually, a lot of you guys, a lot of you guys recommend we go libertarian socialist. So we'll see. We'll get there when we can. Uh, or go NDL. I don't remember the party uh, name specifically. It is what it is. Um, let's see. To go. And someone also told me how to go more libertarian socialist. Other people recommend recommend that I do more uh, thousand week Reich. So we'll see what happens. But yeah. Someone actually told me how to get more libertarian socialist support. So I'm going to treat this just like how I treated uh, modeling and Macmillan. I'm going to do both routes, probably, for Jellico and uh, Harold Wilson eventually, so we'll get there eventually, so. It'll happen. I'm going to do both routes in the end, so. It might not be immediately, you know, one after another, but it'll be pretty close. Pretty darn close. Uh, I just want to get to the 31st. 
Oh, get to the first. Get to the first. First, first, first. Come on. Give us one more day, baby. There we go. Look at that. No brown over here. We love it. It's either gray or blue. It's awesome. Even London's very high on the thing for us. At this point, I'm not even going to bother doing this because the Civil War is going to start very soon once we get the focus in, I think. So. Cool. And we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And apparently, there's like two more routes technically you can do as England, but they don't have content yet. I think it's the more communist route, I think. Hardline communist route, something like that. And there's another coup, Young Democratic League or something like that. I'm not really sure. So, and here we go, my friends. And the AI is going to go and set this stuff up. And this is how we're going to do it. Honestly, this looks very... It's hard to see. But, like... Honestly, like, only this should be rebellious here for the most part. Just because of the way everything was set up. But this is how I normally do my uh, setup for uh, the game. For the Civil War, at least. Uh, you guys did pretty well. You're going to just stay right there. That's fine. I'm going to throw you two here as well, just because I can, because I'm going to throw you. Um, actually, let's get you guys organized first. Oh, there is an open hole there. That is not ideal, my friends. Uh, you guys do that. That's fine. You guys go over here. Six more divisions. We'll slowly go through this stuff. Unfortunately, we, I, I do have to set this stuff up a little bit as well. You, the rest of you guys, just kind of hang out here. Cool. And... We're going to get rid of these guys first. I want to make sure that we can at least hold the line here, but let's do this one first this time. Cool. Alright, who do we want here? You guys are going to attack really harshly. You guys are going to be attacking very harshly as well. I want the most amount of attack here as possible. Thank you. And for you guys, I want you to get quite a bit of defense. Just so you're going to hold the line for quite a bit. Led by Field Marshal Ricard Hull. Uh, yeah, because you're better than Bill Alexander right now. Um, just because you have more defense. You know he's better as uh, skill. That's supply consumption and planning, so that's alright. Doesn't really matter to us. Alright, and finally we can build stuff here. Finally, 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 finally. Get some guns, get some arty, get some support equipment, then grab some trucks. No, oh, anti-tank. Let's grab some anti-tank and then grab some trucks. Uh, motorized. Not APCs yet. Ooh, we are technically using IFEs. Let's do that one first and APCs next. And then jet planes, jet casts. Jet Fighter CV, Basic Jet Cast, and everything else here is going to go bye-bye because I don't really like it using any of those things. And we're, oh, we have not done this yet. We get this whole stuff back again. Um, numbers. Early Battleship. I don't like earlies. I like improved stuff. So basic. Improved cruisers. Basic cruisers. Nah, who cares. Earlies. Alright. I discriminate very heavily here. Uh, Navy doesn't even matter, hopefully. So... And we don't have any chromium anyway, so it doesn't even matter. Cool, and before we begin, let's get these guys going too. Thank you very much. If you need to go up to 100, please set your marks on that. And we're going to focus on the southern region first, just because I definitely, definitely, definitely want to get these guys killed off. Alright, and before we forget, boom, boost, and boost, baby boys. Oh, are we attacking? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I would not recommend attacking right now. Uh, at least you don't attack, you don't attack. Ah, oh, the English Civil War has begun. The German Civil War has presented us with a golden opportunity for freeing England from its collaboration with oppressors and restoring democracy to its people. We manage increasingly public attacks on the government to show the people that they actually do not have to live in the shadow anymore. Now it is time to strike at the heart of the corrupted England. After a brief radio message, with a monarchy's voice, a monarch's voice, the first uprising began. York was the first to fall. After an assault on the army base and brief skirmish with the police force, our troops declared on the public radio that a new free England would be formed from the ashes of the old regime. Other towns in the north will quickly follow. Fighting the Midlands and south continues as we seek to break the hold on the government on these regions. Our preparations will prove critical in the coming days as we seek to secure territory for the war. We we'll also look abroad for allies, both across the Atlantic and across the Channel. War makes for strange bedfellows, we must embrace them if we're, either, if we're to stand a chance of winning the war. We are not as well trained or armed as the Cornwall garrison or the government troops, but with our militias and weapon caches, we should be able to match them in the field until help arrives. If we get help. One a day, we will, be, we will hold Parliament in Westminster and serve the people of England as we bring our country back from the fascist abyss. We can then assert ourselves in the world as a true beacon of freedom and reunite our isles. And never again will the flag be lowered and our country defiled for Britain's... Shall never be slaves. For a queen and country. Well, let's see if we're actually going to bring the queen back. There's no guarantee. Um, they are probably getting ready to leave the area here. They have a lot of guys, actually. Um, this is actually not going to be super easy to do. I need you guys to go in here, too. You should be able to do okay. We'll see what happens. Don't worry about moving. You need to go here. I'll, I'm just going to hold here, too. So, um, I want you and you to hold. Yeah, there's no reason for you to attack. If anything, you need to help support the attack right here. Okay, you're going in now. Okay, okay they're, they're leaving. Oh. Alright, I'm more than happy with this. Oh, they just showed up. God dang it, why'd you show up? Well, if that's the case, how would you guys just go right here? You guys keep these in place. 
That Warsaw Uprising is very nice. Are we doing okay down here? Oh, yes, we are. Uh, we, have to do, we do have to kill uh, Cornwall Garrison, too, so. Well, would you look at that? Somebody got encircled. Whoopsie daisy. English Civil War's begun, as we do like it like that. If we can't win there, at least let us win here. And cut them off there and kill them off. Oh, there goes well, those guys. Nice job, guys. Head on up. Please, please, please. There's only two divisions there. Probably make it three or four max. You guys are all going to die there as well. Keep yourself there. And plentiful. Very nice, very nice. Formation of Africa Shield. Not bad, not bad. They will start attacking us quite a bit more later on, but it's fine for now. Leicester, huh? Hey, old wounds. It was a bright English morning, rare indeed, in the Johnson household. We're going to hang the washing on the Siegfried line, you know, any da 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 dee dee da da dee da. A birdie sang as he tied his laces on his old army boots. Darling, why do you have your uniform on? Haven't you heard on the radio? The war's on again. We're off to fight the fascists on our home soil. Give him and the crowd garrison a good kicking in the pants. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Margaret's eyes grew wide and she sprinted to the kitchen where the radio was still on. War fighting continues. Her Majesty's most loyal resistance urges any person able and willing to stand up for liberty to report to a friendly army base at once for Simon. If possible, please bring. Oh dear God, she would lose him again. Every month in the factory alone, every hour at the home staring at the dusty fireplace came swimming back in her mind. She tried to control herself as she walked towards her husband. Oh, Bertie, don't be silly. You're much too old, and that they might not have you anyway. It's not your fight anymore. That's what Harold said, right? Remember? Her false smile cracked, and she could feel the tears starting to well up in her eyes. Bertie was too busy tying his bootlaces. Still with that awful, devilish grin on his face. Darling, we almost had the blighters in the last one. And this time, we'll really finish the job. We've got a good handle on the... He looked up to see his wife trying to cover her tear uh, teared-up eyes on the stairs. His grin disappeared. I'm begging you not to go. I can't watch you leave again thinking you won't come back. I can't go through this again. There's a long pause as Bertie stood in the door, old rifle in hand, and Mark III helmet on his head. I'm sorry, he said in a softened voice. I don't have a choice. Know that I love you with all my heart. He wasn't singing anymore when he walked out that door. When this lousy war is over, no more soldiering for me. Well, until the, uh, unless Goring starts knocking. <laughs> oh man, that's always a slight word for us. Oh, our capital is Newcastle. You know what would be a real gaming move by them? Just just launch a naval invasion in Newcastle. Which, actually, they might do that. Well, that doesn't happen, but let's kill off those militia divisions. Kill these guys off here. Crimea is gone. We've taken these guys out. Um, I want you guys to all go here, except for you. And I want you to go all the way to Towton. Because these guys actually have a tank division. Oh, yep. They, look at these guys have a tank division. Uh, if that's the case, hold. Um, if that's the case, all but you attack here. Uh, take the infantry because they're actually much better. I only want to attack with generally the best stuff that we got. Ah, they're pushing into here. That's fine, whatever. Uh, once we get this stuff done and this stuff done, we'll be much better off. Ah, hey, the Boer Republic. Hello, Boer Republic. Oh, we're not making any divisions, which is fine. I want max reinforcement. Oh, look at that. Nice job, guys. Nice job. Um, you know what, I'm going to separate half you guys go there, half you guys go here. South African War, pretty typical. Not like we have a really big concern about them right now, though, so. I'll be honest, I'm really not concerned about them. we got to take out Cornwall next. Go in, boys, see what y'all can do. Ah, just in time for some Marty. Now, we haven't done really any of our land auction either, but, you know, it is what it is. I want you guys to go here. Can you actually do that as fast as possible? And circle the tanks and kill them all. Go, 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 go. Nice, we got them in circle, boys. Let the tanks suffer. And our boys are definitely going to suffer attacking a tank division, but they're going to run out of organization stuff, but bombs away. It seemed that he couldn't convince anybody at times. He remembers how his ideas were rejected. The anger he felt when he heard the invasion and destroyed the possibility of ever accomplishing what he wanted to do. And how Parliament sacked and too afraid to contemplate or in retaliation, too feeble-minded to stomach the thought of answering the atrocity that happened right outside their doorstep. And he remembered how he felt that day 15 years ago when nobody listened to, believed, or understood him. But there was a man who was interested in the concept of justice, untempered. And when David Sterling showed up outside his house, he knew things would be different. Sterling is perhaps the greatest proponent of, cons of the concept in Himmler. He managed to twist Claude into supporting what had some called a ludicrous idea. War wreckage and aircraft around England were sourced, with a scrap yard air and a aircraft restoration foundation as a cover story. They were taken to a yard near this airfield where they were covered, covertly prepared for an operational usage. Now tonight the plan was put into action. Four of the aircraft were granted, unable to perform satisfactorily, some unable to perform at all. But twenty were already and would be conducting a show over the port of Plymouth. Arthur Harris has smiled. He recalled the words of Hugh Trenchard. The man who founded RAF, I have laid the foundations for a castle. If nobody builds anything bigger than a cottage on them, it'll be a very good cottage. Don't you dare try to kill us off, you son of a rat face. Ah, we got the tanks. Not even tanks can stop Her Majesty's, uh, Her Most Loyal Majesty's resistance. I forget how to say the name. <laughs> With fire and fury, sorry he couldn't 
clear you to the fly office, said Sterling as he sat in the main hangar office getting warm around a stove. I know you would have loved to see it. Heck, I would have wanted to get up there myself if it wasn't deemed so important. Harris looked into the fire. What, David, he asked? Have you ever felt like you were in a position to win the war and you didn't? <sighs> Sterling pondered the query for a second before responding. I've had a few operations go bad and a few regrets, but I never had as much power to change things as I do now. Though there was a study, began Harris, so that we could win this war in 18 months. In 18 months, we could have shattered the psyche of the German people, leave a third of their population destitute and homeless, and break the back of their industrial machine, all without a single man on the continent. That was a promise of aerial bombing. I believed in that study, David. I had dreams of ending the war at a single stroke with a thousand bombers over a single day, a single city. The end, to end the U-boat menace with flattening of Hamburg, to smoke or the Ruhr off the face of the earth, to light Nuremberg with a glow of white phosphorus, to open the gates of heck under Berlin. But they didn't believe me, and the Nazis did what I wanted them to do with a single bomb over Honolulu. He sighed, but we have something now. Perhaps this ray will prove area bombing might just yet hold the key to securing England's future. He, and he looked at his watch. They should be over Plymouth by now. All Jewish Defense Battalion. Mosh and Judah waited for this day for the longest time. The Jewish community of England was hard hit in the Second World War. Many had been forced out of their homes. Their property had been seized and transported into the Reich as war loot. And many had been killed in the invasion in the aftermath. Mosh and Judah were not both immune to these misfortunes. But while some sought refuge in the north, Mosh and Judah chose a different path. Joining up with the other resistance groups, they vowed to continue the conflict to bring justice for the fallen and the suffering. They called for the other Jews to take up the call, and many did. Secret synagogues were canvassed, and clandestine celebrations were infiltrated soon. There was a sizable Jewish resistance force across the island. When the call came from Claude, they rose up. Now was the time to defend themselves. Now was the time to ensure that justice was carried out. And now was the time to ensure what had happened would never happen again. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Everyone's going to go blind here. And we love it. Single these guys out. Um, there's five divisions there. Uh, you know what? Share the wealth. And by wealth, I mean men. And by men, I'm not going to say yummy or anything, but like, share them. And who's got really good attack here? Bill Alexander, you're the man for the job. Mm, yeah, he's old guard. This guy's got more attack anyways. Um, oh, they're actually attacking us here. That's not good. Um, I think I might attack, try to attack here, actually, and cut these guys in the north off a little bit first. Like I said, this is really not that bad, as you can see. It's really not that bad of a civil war. It's pretty easy. Especially when you really basically push it so your side will win and get most, most points. Or, you know, whatever. You know what I mean. Ah, uh, let the guys reinforce Plymouth is burning. Many of the German garrison are preparing for another night on the barracks of Plymouth Naval Yard, preparing their beds for another night of sleepless, fitless sleep. They take notice of the air raid siren and are confused. Is this a drill? If there doesn't have an air force, does it? Then a panicked officer rushes in and screams at them to man their posts. They run outside, not still believing what they heard was true. This isn't the second Bell Creek, they think. Who would be doing an action like this straight from the past? But overhead, the past already arrived. Twenty bombers had dropped their loads, big loads, barrels of diesel fuel with white phosphorus grenades attached to ensure detonation. At 1936, the first bomb detonates and the inhabitants of Plymouth, civilian and garrison alike, are transported back to the darkest days of the Second World War. Twenty-four minutes later, a port is radioed to the airfield. Complete success, the air crew says. The dockyards are alight. The tank farm in the east end has gone off and the fires are spreading. It is too much for Arthur Harris. For the first seven years, he begins to cry. They have done it. They have truly done it. Turning to Sterling, he says proudly, The Germans ha will have to sleep with one eye open. Where is Plymouth? I mean, I don't know in America, but... Well, I guess we bombed them after we actually took it. Oh, that's not good. Oh, that is really not good if they attack us here. Um, I need you to move down. I need you to move in there. Cool. If that's the case, we're going to counterattack immediately. Send in that normal in infantry, too. These guys, I'm not worried about these. We need to get these guys. Cut off six divisions in the north. Oh, baby. Oh, Himmler does them dirty. Hmm. Oh, in the shadow. Robert Hart was not a very good soldier. He was not a good runner, not a good spider, and rather abysmal shot. But by George, he wanted to serve England. So when a caring officer worried that if Robert got into an actual war, he might kill somebody, said that a post in H Company in the Scottish Highlands was available, Robert was just chuffed to have the opportunity to save his country. One day, on a routine patrol in the middle of a blizzard, Robert saw something, something off, a black figure with, is that a Stahlhelm? Sweet, Mary, it's a Jerry. He called out to his brave companions, but they must not have heard him over the blizzard. The German was getting closer, my god, he's got his gun pointed right at us. Robert raised his gun, shouting to the man to halt, bang, the rest of the patrol looked over stunned. Robert stood there shaking, Everywhere, everyone just stared for a few seconds, and what in god's name do you think you're doing and shooting at? It, it was a Jerry, right over there, 50 yards or so. In the effing Scottish Highlands, are you stupid? He, he looks, the helmet. 
The patrol walked over the crumpled figure in the red snow. There they saw the cross of Red Andrew on his so sh shoulder. Some made crosses on their chests. One man vomited. Robert just stared numb. Oh, Christ alive. Right, this never happened. Bury the body deep. Not under the snow. I mean six feet in the ground. I don't care if it's frozen and nobody speaks a word to the lieutenant or we've all had it. Hours later, the patrol returned. Anything out of the ordinary, chaps? You're a touch late. Robert slumps along. He decided to own up for his crimes. He deserved nothing less than death for what he done, sir. Uh, he didn't get to finish before he was cut off by a squad mate. No, sir. He's just lost, sir. Nothing to worry about. Oh, man. That is... Uh, when you get too excited. Too excited, man. You gotta know where your borders are at, man. They're throwing everything in here. These guys are actually pretty good divisions, so... You know what? If they don't want to die yet, we won't make them die. They can starve. Free or dead? 20 years, uh, thought, uh... Lewis Ball as he trudged through the mud. Twenty years since an acne-ridden teenager with a stain gun shot a Falsham Jäger outside Ashford. How he screamed at him to put his hands up as a German fumbled with his parachute. How he turned around with a sh uh, Schmeisser. How panicked he pulled the trigger and riddled the invader with bullets. That was the first man he ever, ever killed. Much more fighting had gone on in those twenty years uh, for Ball. Him being cut off had to do a lot to do with it. And so did him eventually finding SAS stay behind squad. None of them were too keen on ever giving up and Bell went along with the flow. He saw many of his friends die, seen people mauled Bell on belief by explosions and been in many situations where he believed his life was over, but he kept going. One day he thought England would be free. Any trace of collaboration suppression would be eliminated. England would be a true democracy where everything would be decided by the will of the people. No monarch no, or dictator will be doing the thinking for England anymore, and men like him would no longer be needed. But for now, he had to keep his thoughts in the present. His squad was tasked with wiping on a collaborationist checkpoint. All he had to do was get on the top of the hill before the fern assault began, and who dreams dares? Nice. Come on, boys. There you go. Completely encircled. That is good. You wanna, you wanna break out. You wanna break out. All right, we're going back into attack then. Do they really want to play games? We'll play games. We'll kill every last one of them in there. Ah, oh, the boss. Alcan couldn't get much sleep. Not that anyone could really blame him. There was so much that needed to be done. Supplies and logistics up north. Front lines and strategy in the Midlands. Infiltration and special operations in the south. They would get to anyone. And then there was the standard business of war. Staring at maps and the battle lines in order to look for a weakness on his own lines and an opportunity in the enemies. He could sleep, but there was a driving determination keeping him awake. If he slept, his, he might miss something. He couldn't let the day's work go unfinished. There would be more problems the next day, and if they were compounded on top of the other... He couldn't keep up, and men would die as a result. He could sleep when he got this thing done, he thought. When England was free, when the rightful queen was restored, and when Nazi domination was halted at the English Channel. Then he could finally take a deep, deep, comfortable sleep. A just reward. Next up, I see an area that we could slice off just a few more divisions. Right here. And Oxford. The boys are ready to go. The men, well, they're doing okay. Um, anything else here? Oh, adaptable. We love our men adaptable. Uh, what are we missing? We're actually doing quite well on our equipment. What type of divisions do we have? Are we just using infantry, militia, and trucks? So, oh, garrisons. Oh, I love those garrison divisions. Militias are nice, but garrisons are better. Civilian oversight, thank you very much. Before we forget about that, infantry is not too shabby. I like these guys. Uh, Artillery-wise, it's only 53. Support equipment, how are we doing with this? We're doing okay. Not bad, not great. Militia, they're just... Militia. Women's Anti-Fascist Club? A division. Club, division, same thing. Um, here. They'll become a slightly stronger. Anything else over there? Nah, not really. Not that I really care too much about that stuff. Alright. Let's just get our guys in place. Get them ready to go. We all got a ladder radar. Got planes galore. We're good to go. Send in the boys. Use a militia to help support the attack. Two divisions versus what, like eight or something? Ten? Pretty good. Ah, slice, slice, my friends. Slice, slice. Oh, they're panicking to attack. <gasps> good. Oh, no, we ever ran one of them. Oh, they're trying to bug out. All right, well, I see what they're doing. Get more already, get more of this stuff, too, and get a lot more anti-tank. Actually, get a lot more anti-tank first. There you go. Mm, not today. Well, all right. Well, where do I want to attack next? Hmm. I'm gonna take up north. Let's get over this river first and attack over there. Let these guys move around, they'll be fine. Oh, we are oh boys get us encircled. That's not good, my friends. Oh yes, please attack, 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 so we can uh go and do this. Thank you. And do that. And do that. Yes. 
Weaken, baby. Weaken them. Drop that. Oh, they're dropping like flies. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's real nice. They're weak here. Let's go in. They're attacking us. Can we attack them right back? Oh, yes, please. Ah, London. Uh, that's over a river, and I don't want to do that just yet. So, who do we want to attack first? Here or here? I want to attack over here first. I'm just taking... I'm sorry, I'm taking my time with this. I'm really actually enjoying this. And let's go in. You know what? We'll make London the the last grand battle of this campaign. Or, you know, the Civil War. I want heavy, brutal fighting in there. Alright, boys. There's five in there versus four in there. This might not actually go very well for us. But we do have quite a few guys, and we're running out of fuel, which is pretty normal to be, I guess, English. Whatever. Alright, boys. We've got a country to save. We're going to burn London to the ground so we can rebuild it easier. A barbaric war. The church had been occupied for the past three days. Food had been scarce, but the men continued to pile in anything they could find. Mostly various perishables. They were constantly under siege, absolutely boxed in. Matilda didn't know where Olivia was, but Paul promised to keep her safe. Another crash came in from the front, but Matilda winced. They were probably going to break in soon. Many men had already coordinated plans for escape or even surrender. She had her own ideas, of course. She already accepted that she might die today. She hoped that somewhere Olivia was thinking of her. Matilda breathed in. Do it for her. Let's get more uh, uh, stuff here. The door burst down. Matilda ducked behind a bench near the back of the hall, anticipating a gunshot. Bulls began to fly in as screams echoed around the dusty hall. Matilda nodded at all the men she could see, also ducking behind the pews. Three men. The only way they could ever get out was by being very, very careful. As footsteps drew closer to the benches, Matilda looked through the crack at the bottom of each bench and counted the feet she could see. One, two, three, four. Four men! Matilda grimaced. They were outnumbered. It would take a miracle to escape. Matilda said her prayers as the enemy soldiers checked the pews. She prayed for a miracle, and if she couldn't have a miracle well, she prayed for Olivia. She smirked a little bit. God hated her, at least that's what all the priests said. She heard another loud bang of a gun, followed by the eerie sound of a corpse collapsing to the ground. Matilda held her breath and peeked out of the edge of the pews. In front of her was a leg. She turned around from the... Uh, from her side to her stomach, she, all she wanted to go down. She wanted to go down with her with a fight. Matilda gritted her teeth and prepared for the blast. A bang. The man fell. The rest of the soldiers shocked ran to his aid. They fired wildly. Conscripts clearly up and at him, boys. Screamed Matilda, hopefully exuding more confidence than she was feeling. The men ducked behind the pews, got up, fired similarly. Matilda smiled. The four remaining men fell. The siege was over. The resistance had won this battle, and they lived to fight another day. But maybe not tomorrow. Look at those nine divisions, thinking that they're going to live. Oh, London's going to burn, baby. It's going to burn and it's going to burn hard, whether we like it or not. I like command power. Let's send them all in. The battle for the ages. Here we go. The Battle of London, Member Parliament. Sir, you have to see this, said Private Moss. I think I figured out whose house we just liberated. Lieutenant Fraser looked at Moss. A Himmler platoon had just recently cleared out. <clears throat> this mansion in the countryside and was in the middle of converting it into a temporary HQ. What have you got, Private? Th this guy, sir, he said, showing a binder of uh, newspaper clippings. Had this on his desk. Apparently this guy was one of those MPs in the Royal Party. Had been since the war. A bit conservative one, it seems like. Frazier took the binder and scanned it through. Looks convincing. Do we have a bat, uh, dude? In the garden with the family, along with the household staff, we run it up. All right, then, Frazier says. He handed the binder back. Private, go back there and shoot this MP for treason against England. Muscle son. Uh, what, sir? Need me to repeat that, Private? Um, we might not be winning here immediately, but, you know, whatever. I don't care. Yeah, okay. Oh, the AI was probably trying to build up roads or something. It's fine. I don't care what happens. We're going to burn London to the ground if we have to. The land of collaborators will burn and perish by the time I'm done with them. Besides, if we keep them like this, they literally can't do anything. We have air superiority. Yeah, we do. And even though they're shooting down planes, like, they have nowhere to retreat to, so any, de like, organization losses they take, they can't recoup, so. Go, boys! I can't even pierce the armor! Ah! Zero out of nine divisions can pierce us. The Battle of London is at hand, and we've almost won. Hit them harder, boys. When in doubt, you hit her harder. Ah, copy's pretty good, too. Looks like they're doing last stand too. We force the attack. They're doing last stand, which makes sense for them, but. Ooh, baby. Ooh, eight divisions. Oh, seven divisions. Oh, they're dying. Six divisions. Oh, no. Oh, no. What's going to happen? They're going to die. That's what's going to happen. Five divisions. Five. Come on. Can we make it four? Can we make it four? Come on. But come on. We make it three. Oh, all is left is militia. No more artillery, probably. Oh, London has fallen. We've burned it to the ground, my friends. Ah, oh, and we've lost the game. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, look, we're back. Oh, oh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, you know what? This is actually right at the beginning. Let's go ahead and set everyone else back up. Thank you. Oh, no. 
Oh, this is going to glitch out again, isn't it? Oh, it's going to glitch out. I thought I literally just set this all stuff up already. I literally just did all this stuff, and they make us do it again. Ugh, how terrible. At least, hey, London's still standing out of infrastructure. Well, it's just probably all damaged. Well, we'll see about that in just a second. Uh, military factories. Huh. Then we only have four. So, we need... We have infantry rifles. Anti-tank. We got support equipment. We got artillery. We need motorized. We don't need that. We need APCs. I don't believe in IFVs. At least for TNO. And CAS. And probably Thousand Week Reich as well. There you go. We did this earlier in the campaign. But the video really, literally. There you go. Alright, so what do we want? I want a lot of planes. I want a lot of artillery pieces. I like Artie. I like big Artie. The bigger the Artie, the happier I am. And we lost whatever we were making over here. God dang it again. Here. Have a, have a, a ship. You have a ship. And, you know what? Just because of this, I'm going to go ahead and see you in just a little bit. A barbaric victory, Matilda always wanted to live in an apartment. It was a strange obsession, considering she was raised in a lovely big house with her parents there to guide her along. But she always felt strangely trapped. It was so ornate, so perfect, so clean. She supposed the life of an aristocrat never suited her. She always was an active girl first in the class at field hockey. If she stayed at home, she'd probably end up getting married off. The room was quite bare, really. They put a rug down to try and lighten up the place, and of course she was... There was all that... Oh, there was that cheer that Paul lent them, but really mostly nothing. She heard a call from another room, Matilda Darling, or Maddie Darling, do you think we'll be fine without the curtains? Olivia limped in, her crutches supporting her weight as she entered. I think we'll do fine, Matilda smiled. The day passed. After a lengthy argument about who would get to sit out on the chair, Matilda managed to get Olivia to sit down as Matilda sat down on the floor. They didn't exactly have anything else to do. The post-war scene in England wasn't entirely covered in people hiring, so they talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And talked. Forever and ever. The cloudy sky grew dark, and they started to talk about the war. Matilda suddenly remembered the church, the terror, the... I killed someone, and I enjoyed it, Olivia. It excited me. I guess in the moment I was scared, but, well, he had a family, and I killed him. I saw the light drain out of his eyes, and I just killed him. Matilda's voice grew hoarse, and she started to sob quietly. Mat Olivia looked down at her crying bow, and for once she didn't know what to say. Well, let's do it again. Himmler is victorious. The forces of Her Maj Majesty's most loyal resistance have secured the control over England. The, uh, though some holdouts remain, the majority of the old government units have disbanded or surrendered. Peace and freedom has returned to the land, but the price has been high. Thousands of English soldiers and civilians are dead, and the former workshop of the world has been reduced to rubble. It's time to rebuild, everyone. Time to rebuild. Hey! And we have another 19 divisions, which is very weird that we have exactly another 19. Also, in the meantime, I've converted, like, uh... Well, actually, that's kind of okay with us. Yeah, you guys can do this, too. Um, there you go. Uh, actually, there you go. They, they've got things to do, which is fine, because I've always said them to, like, guard all the ports and garrison and stuff. And I convert all the militia to... Actually, what have two divisions we have here? We have our... Oh, these guys are 10 combat width. You guys are actually 14 combat width. Okay, that's a little different, but whatever. A forgotten word, England. The freedom, a word the former traitor government would have rather preferred to be unmentioned for the rest of time. Freedom is not simply a word, however. It is a state of mind, one that pushes the greatest of men into actions considered impossible. Monarchists and communists, soldiers and laborers and churchmen all worked together not because of force or fear. They fought as one because they would rather die free than live oppressed under the traitor's boots. Himmler is victorious, and England is now free of the rule of those who betrayed it to the fascists decades ago. We have won from Dover to Carral. It is a banner of free England which flies. We did this not for personal glory, but so that the children born in this land will never again have to witness the jackboot of the Reich. Followed up soon with Iberian's control of Algeria, but cornerstone democracy. Um, we remove elite voting, go to universal voting. I like the political power. State press only, regulated meetings, state-controlled unions. All right, not bad, not bad. Young democracy. Ooh, ooh, we, ooh, oh, 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 oh. Let's see, we got that stuff. And actually, I accidentally did more military budget boost, but whatever. We've got a lot of libertarian socialists under Bill Alexander. Birch does not have a unique focus for you right now. Cockburn. I'm sorry for your last name. That sounds really painful. Conservative democracy with George Jellico. Auchinleck, huh? We also have food insecurity, which is really bad. We lose weekly stability and GDP growth. And poverty gets much worse. A promising future is not bad, though. And then we have the growing hunger, which is also quite bad. So immediately we gotta do undoing their evils. England is wounded. None can deny that our land is shattered remnant of what it once was. The Civil War caused much destruction, it is true. Tens of thousands of needless deaths and entire towns left broken by shells and gunfire. Yet the collaborationist government did a great deal of damage in the rule as well. Damage for far harder to heal. Our academics were hunted or forced to tow the government lie. The union of workers beaten in submission or forced up underground altogether. They say nothing of the political persecution of opposition parties. It now falls to him to repair this damage, to undo what went wrong and give the people a glimmer of hope that the future we promise will be worth the wait. Be we soldiers of Sterling, Alexander, or Auchinleck, we owe our countrymen that at least.
and the something over here over the rainbow. The building was just as she remembered it, sullen brook in a shade dark dark brown. The mossy footpaths cracked and broken. The cloudy sky may have seemed dreary to many, but to Matilda it was just as if the world was as bright as a day in Seville. It was just as it was before the uh, uh, she left school years ago with Olivia by her side, walking into an unknown and dark organization to try and find some semblance of hope for the future. And of course they had come so far, such an amazing distance, and here they were, back where they started. Hey, Maddie, Olivia shouted. The cane was new to Olivia, her leg having recovered to the point that she didn't need a wheelchair anymore. She stumbled over to Ma Matilda, smiling confidently. God, it really hasn't changed at all, has it? Matilda grinned and snorted. I suppose not. Why did you want to come back? Well, that's where we met, isn't it? Olivia replied. The girls wandered, noting the little things they remembered. Olivia's chalk scratching that got people gossiping about whether Maggie Thomas was snogging a layabout named Otto from a nearby boys' comp. The classrooms where Matilda would stare out the window, thinking of the ten minutes that she would have with Olivia at the end of the day. Lastly, of course, the bike sheds, the same bike sheds that she would swear she lived in. God, we used to sit down here all the time, Olivia said, as she looked up and down the back of the sheds, covering in dried mud and overgrown moss. Yeah, it was never really that tidy, Matilda said, sitting down. Olivia sat down alongside her. Maddie, uh, I remember a couple years ago, I was sitting here and crying because my dad said something about people like us, and well, he said we would always stay, uh, stay by my side. And that's really stuck with me, because you have, and I love you, and I want to stay by your side, too. And, well, Olivia took a small box out of her jacket. Matilda Lewis, will, uh, yeah, Matilda Lewis, will you marry me? Matilda was in shock. Olivia, what do you mean? We can't. It's not legal. It won't be legal, but we can hide it. I know we can hide it. Then, yes. Yes, Matilda teared up as Olivia grabbed her into a kiss. The two women, hand in hand, left the school together into a brighter future. Fates intertwined. What do you... What is she... I guess you got a ring. I guess no, no, probably not a diamond. Where can you find a diamond in post-war England? Or post-Civil War England? Yeah, I guess you can always find people who have stuff around, but... Or maybe we got it before the war. Actually, it probably makes more sense before the war. Probably makes more sense. Yeah, it's fine. Get some better tanks. Tanks and diamond rings. From the ashes! The first reaction was one of shock. Was it... Was it really? Did that announcement really happen? At the front, there was a bit of hesitation. Nobody wanted to stand up before the men on the other side did, but slowly, the trickle of collaborators began. They came as individuals first, walking over with their hands up. Then there came groups marching into white flags, and it became a flood as the entire army disarmed and marched over to give it up. Many were tired, some were sad, others were happy it was over. The rebels were tired as well, but there was a growing euphoria among them. The civilians were next to crawl out. Most of them were hiding in their basements, hoping that the white bedsheets and the construction of their homes would keep them safe. After the shelling stopped, they knew something was up. They came after... Then came the Himmler cars, proclaiming the announcement from their speakers. The civilians then came out, looking at the destruction in the victorious army marching forward, while the vanquished were being herded towards the rear. Far from the front lines, in Himmler territory, the mood was a lot less subdued. Massive celebrations broke out all over for England. Everywhere ran dry alcohol, consumed by the revelers. They crowded around Himmler's headquarters, calling for Alexander, for Auchinleck, for Sterling, and when one, one showed up, they cheered euphorically. And who could blame them? The suffering and bloodshed was over. Families would not be bombed out. The young men of England could grow up. No longer would England be asked to bear the terrible sacrifices it had endured, and England would know freedom. The last of our enemies is laid low and begin demobilization so we can get some more... Ooh, this does not help out the stability. Clear unexploded ordnance. Kaboom. Wars are not accurate affairs. As often as not, a shell or bomb will miss its target entirely, and with significant fighting in urban and rural areas of England alike, we now face the unfortunate problem of numerous explosive devices, including actual landmines, which for one reason or another, failed to detonate as they were intended to. Using an all-volunteer force, Claude Auchinleck and Bill Alexander have cataloged the areas with the highest number of unexploded munitions and sent the mining crews in to slowly solve the problem. This might well take years to fully effect it, and it is entirely possible that England will never be 100% free of explosive refuse, but it will be an improvement for our people. Just like how there's a lot of bombs, well, some bombs that have not exploded, in, I think, in Germany since, you know, the end of World War II, but... I, oh, oh, I guess we lost all those planes. Okay. Um, you know what? Oh, wow. We don't have a lot, do we? That is a-okay. We got, oh, 21. I called for three. But we'll take 21. Undoing the evils, my friends. Evil be, evil be, a public service announcement. Radio in a household living room with all these demands and shortages of coal, it is up to the householder to economize. Woman to a husband on couch, but what are we going to put in that grate this winter? Gestures to an empty fireplace. Tea leaves? Radio now, don't get excited, madame. My, the man now surprised. Blimey, who's that? Radio, only me. When I was going to say the government is asking you to do two things, or your coal as soon as possible and take 10% in coke or anthracite. Woman, but what does a coke really... Does coke really make a great fire? And the radio announcer says, Oh yes, if you go the right way about it. You cut the you light the fire in the ordinary way with coal using small lumps. 
And a fire is magically built while these instructions are relayed. Thank you. Well, and it's going well. Add some coke or anthracite to the front or the uh, back. Thank you. Oh, and remember to keep the underside clear of ash, so you get a good drive. There you are. So remember, order it now. And remember to get 10% coke or anthracite. Good burning. Nice day. And the radio disappears. The man says, Oh, what's that? What's that about a radio? Oh, we want to hear it now. The radio re reappearing. Sorry, sorry, I forgot. But remember, order now. 10% coke or anthracite. Begin demobilization. The struggle of liberation was one undertaken by a good many tens of thousands of loyal Englishmen from villages and factories, dockyards and farms they came, men and boys and even women who all knew that the evils of fascism and totalitarianism had to be expunged from our nation whatever the cost. The top ranks have spoken. It's been agreed that now that the struggle is over, it's time for most of our men to return home. Let's let them trade guns for hammers and ranks and plowshares. Let them return to normalcy. A professional corps of Himmler fires will stay on, of course, but they will exist to form the backbone of the future English army, now to oppress the people they are supposed to protect like the traitor forces have done. Go down to volunteer only more political power, lose a leader experience gain, more organization, less population. Fine with us. A solemn duty. Alfred Fisher has always been proud of the fact that he took up the di uh, diaconate, or diaconate, rather than the priesthood in the Church of England. It was a sinful feeling, true, but Deacon Fisher never told anyone but God of this particular flaw of his. Perhaps because it made him, made he, what he did all the now the harder. St. Joseph's Hospice had been a winery before the war burnt its vineyards into ash, and Alfred liked to think his patients enjoyed the view of recovering plant life more than they would like the dull concrete of a hospice in the city. It would have been easier if the hospice had been for the old, but many of the men Alfred had helped even do the simplest of things were startlingly young. Some of, them, some of them had no doubt sided with the government, others with Himmler. Some might have been commies, fascists, royalists, and or Republicans, or a dozen more things. It didn't matter to Alfred. What difference did it make if the man who had gave the sacraments to were from the side who lost? He had helped the amputees into the wheelchairs each day, all the same. He'd read books to the blind and comfort those mentally afflicted as best as he could. He did his best and begged God for forgiveness for all that he simply lacked the time to do. War takes from all sides and gives little of substance. That's a good thing war is evil, we grow fond of it. Unless we grow fond of it. Now the disposal team. A car pulls up to the farm in Islip, a village in Clingdon, Kidlington. Six men hop out, one officer, a sergeant, four soldiers. The areas are the site of a heavy fighting in the Civil War, and the farmers unable to plow his fields due to the amount of unexploded ordnance. It's a valid concern, especially at sites which are prone to digging. Just last week, a man was killed by an S mine outside of Ipwich uh, while digging a drainage pit ditch. One of the old soldiers takes out a metal detector and begins walking, scanning the ground in front of him. The others follow behind, the other soldiers carrying shovels. After a short walk. The man with the metal detector hears something unusual in his earphones. He stops, scouts the area a bit with his underground sonar, and then raises his hand. The sergeant and the officer come over, as well as the man with the shovel, lightly digging the surface up. They try to find the source of the disturbance. Most of the time, it's nothing. Just some lost objects or piece of scrap, but this time, it's like something to be scared of. It's an artillery shell that has failed to explode upon landing. They dig around the nose gently. Then a man removes a fuse of the shell with delicate precision. He pulls it clear. The shell is now disarmed. Another man takes a case and begins pulling out the plastic explosive inside. It'll be burned later with the other ordinance they find here. The men march on behind the man with the metal detector. There are thousands of acres of England contaminated with ordinance, and they have only one cleared, cleared only one today. On to the next one. Life begins anew. Um, this gives us better amount of GDP, or should I say, it lowers the penalty for GDP growth, income rate factor, poverty, and remove growing hunger. Hunger. Life begins anew. Himmler is a volunteer for us. We, we had no need to conscript when the vast majority of our fighters were militiamen or defecting soldiers. Alas, but being a volunteer does not insulate our soldiers from the effects of combat. Shell shock is rampant amongst those units which spend a great deal of time on the front lines, especially the militia formations which bore the brunt of much of the fighting. Many who fought for our cause lost limbs, senses, and even family members when brother fought brother amidst the chaos. We owe them more than mere words can convey. We shall do our best to ensure nobody who sacrificed something dear to their person, for free England will be forgotten, and that those who sacrifice everything shall be remembered forever until no no things go broke so we actually won before 19 even 65 that was actually not too bad um no just keep doing this stuff why not we could use better guns artillery can we get better artillery then yeah we can awesome love it love it love it 1.3 billion, not too bad, the welcoming party. The division boarded the train from Edinburgh early in the morning. It wasn't a formal ceremony of demobilization, and that had been done the day before. And it wasn't a complete division. Some of the men had decided to stay in Scotland and transfer to the other units in the Scottish army. The whistle blew, and the chartered train left the station. An hour later after it left the station, it passed through the Lamberton Rail checkpoint, leaving Scotland to cheer for the men. Passing through the Himmler checkpoint just a few meters away, they were greeted with a salute by several customs officials. The men were eager to disembark, but the train didn't stop at the northernmost English station at Berwick upon Thede. It continued going further and further into Northumberland County, where it reached the village of Pegswood. The men got off the train and filtered into a line, not taking their luggage. Still in the Scottish uniform, 
uniform. They march in a line off the platform, up the footpath to the road, make a ride, and after a brief stroll alongside the road, onto the green of the Pegswood Community Park. There, they are greeted by crowds of cheering people, local notables, Himmler soldiers, a symphony of orchestra playing pomp and circumstance, even before all the men had arrived, even before the speeches, even before the reunification with the long separated family members. The men were moved to tears. Some choked up as they sang Land of Hope of Glory, Mother of the Free. The exiles of the Northumberland County Division are returned home. Welcome home, boys. Welcome home. Cornerstone Democracy. For years, England was the main force behind freedom and democracy throughout the, throughout the globe. The entire might of our nation ensured the world would always stand against despots and would-be world conquerors. But today, our system is broken and England is controlled by an emergency military di dictatorship. We must restore democracy as soon as possible to make good on our promises to the population and to show we really are going to create a free and democratic England. Well, look, the boys are home. Are they any good, though? That's a real question. Uh, well, they're better than your average group. Hey, they actually have two motorized? That's very weird. Uh, just make them... Um... Uh, that one, I guess. It's fine. Train them. They all need training. And actually, we have 14 army XP, so... Actually, are we losing stuff every day? No, we're not. Oh, Alkalmuk is giving us stuff, too. Yeah, I don't want that one. Um, 14 combat width. We are at 10. Yeah, I prefer 14. We could throw in some arty here, too. Go on two. Make them 20 combat width. There you go. Easy. We don't need to spend an extra five to fill up with infantry, so. And that was infantry division. Nice. We're gonna need a lot more already where we're headed. Holy crap. Goodbye. I, I might keep that one. This is that one for now, for now though. Um, operations go low, go high, go medium. Nice. Life begins anew, my friends. Normalcy. Talcester had come in for a heavy punishment in the war. Artillery had hit many of the homes, and vicious house-to-house -house fighting had caused further damage. Many of the buildings were destroyed, and the citizens had fled far away from the fighting. Today, they were trickling back, clearing the rubble, and trying to rebuild their town. Their stock had rebuilt in the St. Lawrence Church, leveled by a Himmler artillery strike to dislodge a collapsed sniper. Taunton got off a bit easier than many other towns, but so had massive changes. The German garrison was eliminated, and an Englishman was put in his place. The signs in German are gone now, replaced with English road signs. For the younger citizens of Taunton, it's still shock. One day, the German soldier would shoot at anyone pa out past Levin, and now the English police officer just tips his hat and walks on his way, but they're still getting used to it. Even the spot in London where the blast happened and this started, that started this whole business had returned to normal. Cable Street is quite as well, and cars go up and down without much thought, except for the monuments raised by the government to commemorate England's long and eventual struggle towards freedom and liberation. All around the country, people put the worst of the Civil War behind them, as well as uh, unpleasant bits of aftermath as well. The darkest chapter in England's history has left deep scars, but they are no longer cuts, and now England can now move forward uh, towards a better tomorrow under freedom. We keep marching through. A guiding hand. Or state press only. Remove state press. Lose political power, get more stability. This one, you get more political power. They remove state controlled trade unions, and we'll probably do this one next. Restore and trust. Years of being governed by a supposed democracy that disenfranchised the majority of the population, ruthlessly targeted any dissident, has left the population extremely jaded about democracy. The general triumph of dictators over the democratic nations has also left people a bit pessimistic about our government. We'll tell them exactly why that's wrong. What we experienced was merely a Reich's commissariat with a facade thrown over to try and give it an air to legitimacy. Our government will be a true democracy, will not make the mistakes as the ones in the past. The guiding hand. Every revolution, every revolution has its heroes, ones who rest their lives in freedom to create a better world, And but now the revolution is over. And what role should these heroes take? Bell Alexander, Cloud Auchinleck, David Sterling, all have certainly done their part in this battle. But the next phase is approaching, and they certainly don't wish to stick around too long and overstay their welcome. They will need to decide how to best use their status in order to aid the revolution. Scottish repatriation program popular with exiles. Edinburgh, Scotland, AP. Many exiles, English exiles, are taking advantage of the new repatriation program where the Scottish government covers a part or all parts of the cost of emigrating back to England. Our research has found that many refugees in Scotland have a desire to return home, but the main factor in preventing that is a lack of resources to afford moving. Governor and spokesman Tom McLeod said, English refugees typically lack financial resources when they arrive to begin with, so the support helps them get back on their feet when they return. The reaction to the program in Scottish media has been mixed. Most credit the government for finding a solution to recent tensions with the exiles, one that avoids the forced population deportations that have plagued the continent in the past few decades. Some papers, however, pose a program. Some are calling any action to move the people as, as inhumane, and others decry the use of taxpayer money for this purpose and call for harsher methods instead. But the exile community is almost universal praise for the program. Edinburgh Waverley train station has had plenty of refugees purchasing one-way tickets to the uh, English town of berwick von tweed where they plan to ride on English railroads the rest of the way to the new homes. Nearly all the departing exiles have, there have claimed their rebates. I think it's wonderful, said Emmeline Cooper, a housewife who is returning with her husband and two children to the town of Melton, North Yorkshire. Scotland has been very kind to us, and I'm sure the English people will appreciate the gesture as well. Uh, thanks? Well, for two years. That's alright. Sounds pretty good to us. Oh, something happened there too. Eh, doesn't matter. It ain't us, and that's okay. 
Young Democracy Law. Nothing is more threatening to a fledgling state than its first steps. Be it ambitious military officers or a politician seeking to make new opportunities for personal gain, it's always at the beginning that a state is the most vulnerable to falling from its path. Alkin like and ex Alexander are well aware of this, and more importantly, both are well aware of the possible consequences of any part of Himmler trying to subvert the democratic process. Thus, the Young Democracy Law has been proposed, which will give authority to a select council of Hitler veterans to, during the formative years of this resurrected democracy, suspend that democracy for the good of the English people, if need be. Only with the mutual agreement of both Alkenluck and Alexander can this law be enacted, and only against a threat using the guise of democracy to end or pervert it, or the collapse of democratic institutions leaving England with good governance. Followed up with the start of reconstruction. With much of the civilian leadership rendered unable to assist us due to the siding with the collaborationist government and what civilian apparatus we do possess, mostly being limited to the more local positions, it had been decided that the reconstruction of England will take place under military authority. A series of reconstruction commands, each covering a dis distinct region of England, shall govern the rebuilding process, deciding on the priorities to be given for specific issues and acting as a temporary judicial and governing branch for the provisional government, needless to say. These will be influential positions, and whoever holds them may affect the popularity of the nascent political parties in the upcoming elections? Absolutely. Cut and spend. One, one point one two billion. Wow, that growth sucks. But it's a necessary evil. My goodness, this looks this sucks too. Wow. Lozano, good job, Lozano. Start the reconstruction. Young democracy law. So the problem is that oftentimes revolutions are not successful. Said Alexander, there's a power struggle or dysfunctional governments or even new despots that result, and there needs to be a way of dealing with them. So, you're proposing some sort of legal mechanism to stop this? Asked Alkenluck. Precisely. There needs to be some way that if what we make up ends backfiring on us. Some way we can safely set England back on course if things go away that we won't plan, and only in an emergency. Now, the government is crippled by dysfunction and instability because there may come a time when things are disastrous and threaten the entire concept of England as a state, and when that happens... Alkenluck thought it over. The Americans, when the Articles of Confederation didn't work out, they had a constitutional convention called to write a new legal charter, and they did it without the will of the federal government, I recall. And nobody had the prominent citizens behind it, a variety of men who nobody would accuse of partisan or desp despotic ambitions. Washington even hated the concept of political parties. We need something like that, something that could cut around any political instability and fix any problems with England before they cripple the nation. But who would lead such an organization, said Alkenluck? I'm too tied up with the right of the country, and you're too far left for many others. But if we got together and ruled England by a committee... Better us than anybody else in Major Sterling protests the YDL. A legalized potential coup, yelled Sterling as he slammed the paper down on the desk. Just what the F is this? David, I know you're upset, said Auchinleck, but the Young Democratic League is necessary to ensure the security of the government. But given a legal backslide into authoritarianism, does every government only exist by the will of King Alexander and Queen Auchinleck? If we want a monarchy, why don't we just bloody well bring back Edward out of prison to officiate it? The government hasn't held an election yet, and you already we have a group of people planning to overthrow it. David, what we're doing is making a contingency plan for if things go wrong. If we don't, what happens if things do go wrong? Don't make them go wrong, or stop trying to make an extreme solution to a theoretical problem. I guess he's not going to be a member then. Uh, let's the, from the ashes. Reconstruction. Oh. We will now begin con construction once again. Holy crap. That looks bad. To the roads. Um, honestly, hmm. It's probably good to get through all this stuff immediately first. Yeah, I, I definitely want to get rid of this penalties of GDP stuff. So I want to get through this stuff. The reconstruction of England. I want to beeline to, to get that one as fast as possible. And it, it doesn't take that long, so. From the ash. Rivers clogged with the remains of bridges, shells of factories being lived in by hundreds of homeless people. Vast fields of burnt wheat trampled on by many machines, block after block of collapsed brick piles where the homes once stood. Bombs and unexploded shells being discovered every day. England is a land destroyed, a land broken beyond use, but we shall rebuild it to make England one remembers. To make the, the England one remembers, and to make an England that will lead one into the future. Nice. Northern excursion. Uh, oh boy. The direct flight from London arrived at Edinburgh Airport early in the afternoon. The twin engine aircraft taxied next to the motorcade and stopped. A set of stairs was provided for the plane and the occupants got off. The most prominent among them was a new English ambassador to Scotland and his family. They got into a limousine provided for them by the Scottish government. The motorcade departed the uh, airport soon after, and after a left turn, it was a straight shot to central Edinburgh. Farmland turned into small homes, and small homes turned into multi-story commercial buildings as they arrived downtown. Holyrood P Palace, the official p home of the Scottish Parliament, came into view, and the vehicles were allowed on the grounds after a security check. The ambassador and his family went inside and waited while the President of Scotland finished up the last few minutes of a meeting with their economic advisors. After that, the ambassador was allowed in. The President greeted them all personally and asked what the children thought of Scotland. Then the letter of credence from Auchinleck was presented, signifying the ambassador was the official representative of England to the President. A picture was taken off of the handoff, with both the President of Scotland and the English ambassador smiling. 
This photo got a lot of coverage in Scotland the next day, as well as a Scottish ambassador in England presenting his credentials at the same time. Exchanging ambassadors was a final sign for the Scottish they were now on high diplomatic relations with England, and were now respected as an independent nation. They also expressed hope England would maintain this newfound feeling of goodwill and respect. If it all goes well, we can be doing the same thing without the need for ambassadors. Well, but a modest proposal. Colonel David Sterling, we received your memo and we have been very intrigued by your proposal. The U.S. is interested in close cooperation with their fellow OFN aligned powers and the idea of international terrorism is a grave concern to all of us. Thus, your proposal is of great interest to us. Your idea of a multinational special operations unit with an emphasis on counterterrorism is indeed one solution to this problem. If we were to make the organization, we agree that special operations forces from America, England, and various OFN nations, as well as various national intelligence agencies coordinating at the site would be the right way to staff it. However, your proposal of England as a base of place is interesting and a bit unusual even with your stated reasons of unparalleled experience of the Special Air Service, with accessibility via British Airways from Heathrow and advantageous press restrictions under English law. We will think about your proposal for the Spectrum organization get back to you. The Navy requests that you refrain from asking for updates, as we'll get back to you with our final decision. Best wishes, Admiral Horacio Rivero, Jr., USN. That was a rejection, wasn't it? It wasn't a hard no, but it was a kind of a no. And to roads. England has long known the importance of solid infrastructure. The Romans laid solid paved roads that we still use today. Our canals made us an industrial power, and our railroads brought us much of the world into more enlightened age. Now we are mired in poverty, our roads are destroyed, one may draw a conclusion from this. England's roads will be rebuilt, broad highways will link our nation together, trucks and cars will have to go smooth, well built paths to any area they wish to go. Now with the proper framework in place, we can begin our industrial reconstruction. Followed up, rebuilding the system. Reconstruction of England? Oh, and get rid of that immediately? Uh, I do want to get rid of this stuff soon, but rebuilding the system. England's economy does not work. In fact, it hasn't worked for many years. Many of it's merely the result of massive destruction and carnage from the two massive wars on the island, but there are a few things that just don't work, and we'll be prepared to replace all of it. Taxes, regulations, jobs, industries, everything will be rebuilt. And if we know that it won't work, we'll just reform it and put in something that will. England will be prosperous again, and we're going to do anything to make that happen. Uh, to the army. I kind of don't mind this one, but we don't really need that yet. Where to send the men? To the people. One must not forget why we're doing all this. Not for some narcissistic desire to have our nation achieve some arbitrary definition of greatness. Not for the sole wish to have the collabs and traitors suffer. We're doing this for the people of England. They do not deserve what was inflicted upon them by the Germans and their quizzling lackeys. They deserve to have the say in how things are done. And they deserve to have a decent and happy life. We will remember this and make it clear where our priorities lie. Nice. An English person's duty. The time has come. The candidates have been chosen for every party in the seat around the country. The parties have chosen the next prime ministers they hope will occupy 10 Downing Street. And now comes a short yet chaotic tradition of English Parliament, rare yet so consequential for the future of the nation, it's time for the elections. The National Democratic League and Socialist Labor Party are the two major political organizations in this election. The NDL, headed up by George Jellicoe and backed up by Claude Auchinleck, stands for the restoration of traditional pre-war England, but with the necessary reforms to keep it relevant in the modern age and to make it respected once again on the world stage. The SLP, headed up by Harold Wilson and endorsed by Bill Alexander, has taken a more radical approach. England will finally cast out the chains that held the workers down and move towards a more equitable future, free of poverty with the rest of the worldwide proletariat. There's also David Sterling's organization, but many observers regard it as an extremist minor party. The choice will come down to Jellicoe's promises of a past glory restored, or Wilson's promises of a future glory to be claimed. Oh boy, I, I have to choose now? I just want to do the people, man. Bread and what? At long last, the hunger plaguing our nation is beginning to subside. Our efforts have been successful, and soon we won't have a problem like that anymore. So what do we do to put our efforts into the leftover cash? Welfare is a good option, since many have other issues aside from hunger. A strong and democratic system would require some extra cash as well. Or we could just spend it on the army and ensure another humiliation like this will not happen again. So, um, oh, we're led by Alkenluck. Like on the thumbnail. But, uh, I'll be honest here, like, like I said earlier, I'm going to do both routes. So, ooh. Well campaign for the Social Slavery Party, for Queen and Country, the NDL. I don't know, I kind of want to go radical right now. I probably let's just go with SBL for now. We'll campaign for the Social Labor Party. I apologize for that, but we're gonna do both in the end, so it'll be fine. We'll do both. Oh crap! This stuff. Um, National Democratically, we need the progressive for this campaign. I, I was kind of figuring we'll go with Harold Wilson anyways, and we'll go back and do Jellico some other time. Probably within three weeks of the, the time that this video comes out, so. Uh, let's see. So we want SLP. MSA is there, too. Hmm. And I've heard that this can get actually bugged out, which is not good, but still. 10 parliamentary seats. 1351. That's a lot. Actually, that's... 50, 51's a lot. 35? We got a lot here, too, which is nice to see. 55. 49. We're pretty much in the lead around here, too. I and mean, we could always lose it, but... Let's see that one. There you go. 
Now we gotta keep an eye on this stuff too. Oh my goodness. Well, bread and what? To the army. Our military accomplished what it is set out to do. It defeated the collaborators and set in place a new system of government that will help the people of England. But in its new role, it's not as adept as it should be. It must be reformed. We'll begin to make the necessary decisions to shape the military in the ways we want. Ban from service and military assistance. Get those women shot. Come on, let's go. Anything here yet? Nope. Less than a billion? Not bad. Actually, what are we building? One and almost two a day. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Give it, I want give it some more time. Gonna keep an eye on what's gonna happen here. Nice. Hey, flip for now. Um, that's still pretty darn close. I don't like that. Where do they do stuff next? Uh, East Midlands. I kind of want to do it again just in case to keep it a little bit more under our, our uh, control. So bread and what? Bread and games. Do the army. SLP. And what are they doing? Oh, they changed it here. Oh, uh, so we're probably not gonna be able to get Sussex. That's fine. All right, and we're 38 percent. That they went down a little bit more, which is nice. 35, 35, 40, 35, 30. Well, we're really going Wiltshire. here. That's pretty good. Um, we're doing pretty well up here as well. Oh, Gloucestershire, 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 huh? Oh, they're doing really well up there. So we're probably not going to do that. Oh, this is pretty good to do. Yeah, East Anglia, 14. I'd rather do this one. That'd be good. All right. And then, where to send the rest? The army has thousands of extra soldiers, regulars, local militias, and reservist groups. Some say this is too much. They say they could be doing much more useful work in other places. Things like rebuilding our nation, repairing factories, repaving roads, and that sort of thing. This is an interesting proposal. We have to consider the possibility that our forces could be more effectively utilized in other ways. Oh, crap. I remember this stuff. Um, we do want to get more efficiency here. So, I don't think I'm going to spend that much PP on this right now, but... Um... Military loyalty will increase. Moderately decrease. Mildly increase. Mildly increase. Mildly decrease. Uh, I forget which one's better. That's not good. Well. Government, I want more government stability. So, loyalty or concessions. Efficiency. I want more loyalty. So, and then military... Loyalty will moderately increase. We need to do efficiency next. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. And we'll do that one too. There we go. So now, the current loyalty is 67.5. It'll be going down to 63% next. Yeah. Why not? There you go. Alright, so that's not too bad. Oh, wow, this all kind of flipped over. That's nice. Uh, I'm going to do here. That's pretty not bad, actually, either. 16%. Let's do this one. Oh, and we got this one, too. Nice. Where's in the rest? Well, up the English Phoenix. The scars are still present on the English landscape and their English soul, but thanks to the Reconstruction Commands, they're scars rather than open wounds. The process of healing won't be able to fully get onto its feet until the police have elected a new government, but nobody would be lying if they said the comrades or commands did a darn good job with what they had. From the ashes of oppression and war, a new England rises. An England without the shackles of totalitarianism, without the vultures of fascism picking at its bones. From here and forever, it is a free England which shall govern this land. Governed by the people, of the people, and for the people. Not for the tyrants in Germania and a curse upon his house. Let him know that the fires of freedom rises. Oh, absolutely. And what do we have now? Ah. I'm not sure where they're doing their stuff. This is still... 51, I'm going to do this again, because 33% is still kind of high, in my opinion. And then we'll do the Oxford Trials. No matter what they do with the officials and military members of the collaborationist regime have been a hotly debated subject. The left resistance, Himmler proper, and Sterling's faction all have been disagreements, having disagreements on the fates of the accused and indeed on many groups of people as a whole. A solution is agreed by to Auchinleck, Sterling, and Alexander to hold a series of public trials for the most notorious collaborators, so that our people in the world may know that this government is not the same as which it replaced. That it values justice, not merely revenge out of hand. They may be guilty to a one, but the traitors will receive a fair trial for their sins. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Nice, 32% is good. Um, yeah, here, yeah, seems pretty good too. We should win here, we, right? We should win here. And the head of the snake, the bootlicker. Lick, lick, lick. The formist? Let's do the head of the snake. 
Alec Duthers, who I'm the longest serving Prime Minister in the history of collaborationist England, but when his electoral strength still remains undefeated, his tenure was ended by the free peoples he had tried to submit. No, we shall bring him before the court to defend himself. He's accused of every injustice, every violation, every misery suffered by the English people during this war, every order, action, inaction, can be traced to him and him alone. We intend to make him answer for every one of those crimes, and prosecute the leader of the collaborationists to the fullest extent for those crimes committed under his command, the Oxford Trials. The newly established government of England has determined that the upcoming trials against the collaborators will take place in the city of Oxford. In keeping with England's democratic and liberal traditions, fairness will be triumph over fury, and every single trial will be conducted to its fullest extent with the utmost fairness. The crimes and sentencing of any accused person will be treated with deadly seriousness, but we will have to take public perception into account. If we act too mercifully, the public will call us weak, and act too harshly, they will smear us as tyrants. If we follow the rule of law, we will be rightfully accepted as liberators. Now we must select our judges. Um, not bad. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Over here, pretty good. We didn't even have London, Jesus. Oh, that's pretty nice. Actually, do we have two of these guys here? Hmm. Oh, this one's pretty good to do. Thank you. Scottish President Robert McIntyre makes a state visit to London from London Reuters. In the first visit to an independent Scottish leader to England since the 16th century, President Robert McIntyre arrived at Victoria Station yesterday. McIntyre and his wife Letitia were treated to a welcoming ceremony by the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment and the Coldstream Guards. Some small protests by people who believe McIntyre's Scottish National Party betrayed the UK in the Second World War were held, but the Scot crowd was largely positive towards the visitors. After an informal lunch at the Buckingham Palace, McIntyre then held meetings with the Prime Minister, other cabinet members, and the leader of the opposition. During these meetings, several trade agreements between Scotland and England were finalized, including one where Scotland agreed to purchase several aircraft for their flag carrier airline. Oh, there's even more stuff here. I forgot about this. In speech to the Parliament today, McIntyre spoke at length about the shared history and cultural links between England and Scotland, especially the recent support of Himmler during the Civil War by the Scottish Government. Members of Parliament who hoped for a change in the SNP's stance against unionism were disappointed, although President McIntyre did state that Scotland would gladly work with England as an equal partner in economic and defense issues. The visit to Westminster was capped off with President McIntyre laying a wreath to the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. A state dinner was held by the Scottish President in Westminster Abbey this evening, with 150 guests in attendance. In remarks before the dinner, McIntyre thanked the people of England for their hospitality and offered to host the Prime Minister on a state visit to Edinburgh in the near future. We have to be friendly to him, I mean, he did give us all those guns. And then the bootlicker. Arthur Chesterton, if there was a man more reviled in all of England, hated by both rebels and collaborators alike, we have yet to find him. A fascist demagogue so low he could walk under a dash hound's belly in the head of the collaboration of secret police, the head of a blackshirt paramilitary group during the war, certainly has an enormous to answer for, though we will be tried to be fair to him. As one can be when looking at an individual as heinous as Chesterton is, the six judges. Much debate has raged through the resistance forces regarding the fairness of the upcoming Oxford trials. Some have argued that complete, or ne completely neutral, apolitical men should be selected, though those that voices are few and far between. Various factions within the resistance are pushing their own suggestions and accusing each other of being puppets. A swift compromise has been reached. Two judges from Sterling's camp, two judges from the left resistance, and two judges from Her Majesty's most loyal resistance proper have been selected to share the responsibilities of judging the collaborators. Much rest on the shoulders of these men. Let us hope they put the country above all else and let the trials begin. I forgot we could scroll up and down here. My bad. Even though, then again, if we scroll up and down, it's looking pretty darn well for us, so... Actually, it's looking so well, I'm not sure what to do here. I'll uh, do this one again. That's fine with me. The head of the snake. Alec Douglas Holmes was escorted into the courtroom, already certain on how he would be judged. He held no hope that the judges would grant him mercy. He was a PM, and to the rebels, he betrayed his country and betrayed his people. Holmes was forcefully motioned to his seat alongside his defense team, who he could not hide the contempt for him. These were the friendliest faces in the room. And then the judge began <clears throat> the proceedings. Alec Douglas Holmes, you stand here in front of all of England, accused of heinous crimes. You stand accused of high treason against England and her people. How do you plead? Not guilty, his lawyer responded unconvincingly. Holmes' defense team gave an uninspired, stunted speech that claimed that he was too scared to fulfill his duty as an Englishman to resist the Germans and feared for his life. Once they were finished, the prosecution immediately tore into Holmes, insulting his character, calling him a coward, and of course, a darn bloody traitor. The jury took no time to deliver the deliberation. Holmes' first thoughts after the verdict were of rage. Those fools. Once Germany gets back on their feet, they would be back to crushing England once and for all. There would be no more England after they were done, but he calmed down. There was no use in spending his last days angry at people he understood. He only wished they weren't so hasty. Holmes was not phased as they sentenced him to death, and did not struggle as he was pulled back to his cell to wait his fate. The snake received his due judgment. Meet the cool uh, sauce. The Kulsa, uh, Kulsa family didn't know what to expect when they were going uh, to be smuggled. My apologies about this. Ah. From the coast of Lithuania in an iron barge going to Sweden. And they didn't know what to expect when they landed there. 
Long ago, they decided Sweden wasn't safe because of its friendly ties with Germany, so they cost the country to get on another ship, one which took them to another country, and one for that for sure wouldn't betray them to Germany, and thus they knew the worst was over when the smugglers dropped them off in Norwich. Eventually, the Kulases ended up with many other Lithuanian immigrants in the neighborhood of Bechtown. Their life was tough, crime was rampant, poverty widespread, and oftentimes it felt they were not wanted by the public. Little Jokimas was harassed by his peers at school for his limited understanding of English. Edvadas had trouble finding steady work for the longest time, and the neighborhood had quite a had quite a fright when some youth painted a swastika on one side of the Kulas' apartment building. Sometimes they considered moving to somewhere else, Scotland, New York, or even Vancouver, but in the end, they stuck it out. Now things are looking up. Edvardas took a, found a job as a chef of a local village or a local restaurant, cooking up the Sepelianai for hungry Londoners. The kids are doing well in school, and it seems like Kulasia, of course, the family has finally put the violence and salvation of their homeland behind them forever, basking in the peace and prosperity of a free, Eng free England instead. If there's land for a free man anywhere, it is this. The book Bootlicker. A.K. Chesterton shuffled into the room, escorted by two guards, his eyes darting from the judge to judge. A low murmur erupted throughout the room as the court glared at the old man in disgust and fury. He sat beside the defense team who were barely making eye contact. Arthur Kenneth Chesterton, you stand here in front of all of England, accused of the most heinous crimes. You stand accused of high treason against England and her people. How do you plead? Not guilty, came the muted response from his barrister. The defense enthusiastically referred to his service as a veteran in both world wars, fighting bravely against the Germans in Africa during both bloody conflicts. By engaging in collaboration, he sought to protect England from the Germans and improve the broken political system he had been left behind by the failures of the pre-war government. The prosecution naturally had a field day. They accused Chesterton of being a proud, self-proclaimed English fascist and the former confidant of Oswald Daddy Mosley, a vile man who exploited the surrender of England to push his own hateful ideology. They portrayed him as a willing bootlicker who fervently supported Germany's actions and willingly became the figurehead for a rabidly anti-Semitic faction of the Royalist Party. The jury were confident of his guilt, but struggled to decide a sentence. NDL members and moderates wished to sentence him to death while hardliner SLP and Sterling supporters alike demanded death by hanging through the mafia aisles. So everywhere they do stuff. Send him to the gallows. Movement in support of the army with support increase. The execution of Alec Douglas Holm. Holm sat in a cell awaiting his fate. He had already come to terms with his impending execution not long after his sentencing. There was no use fighting it now. However, as death crept closer and closer to him, Holm's Lord's home. Uh, his mind drifted to another life. He thought of a life where he helped the resistance. He saw himself smuggling documents out of Westminster, subtly resisting the Germans from inside Parliament, but wasn't that what he was doing already? It was an open secret that many in Parliament had no love for the Germans. Yes, they were collaborators, but it was necessary to work from within to keep the boot from coming down too hard on all of England. Holmes' rationalization was interrupted by two guards who ushered him to his feet. It's time. Holmes was into the sunlight and saw a courtyard. He recognized the Tower of London, which loomed over him. He was escorted to the opposite side of the Tower Green and made to kneel against the wall and saw a small gap gathering seated or assembled to watch. He couldn't make out anyone, but he was sure Auchinleck was watching. The firing squad marched in, halted, and executed Chris right face. They stood at attention, awaiting for the commands. Ready, the sharp command came, puncturing the morning air. The soldiers raised their rifles, Holmes' mind filled with activity. He continued to try to rationalize his decisions, if only to himself. Aim! The soldiers trained the rifles on him. Holmes saw a little fear in their eyes, just resolve. Finally, regret swarmed through Holmes' mind if they only could take it all. Fire! Holmes' last thoughts of regret were interrupted by four shots that rang throughout the courtyard. Well, the head of the snake has been cut. The traitor. Bernard Montgomery. If he had died in the invasion, he would be forever remembered as a hero. If he had refused service with the collaborators, he still might be. If he had joined with Himmler, he would have had a chance at redemption, and yet here he is. The case is clear-cut. He was in charge of the collaborationist army, and everything the army did could be blamed on him. However, he still has conducted actions in the past that were admirable, and there remains a not insignificant amount of respect for him among Claude and his supporters. Might it be worth it to temper justice with mercy? Maybe, perhaps. But we must continue campaigning. Uh, 39%. Oh, it's not too bad over there. Not too bad, not too bad. Ooh, East Anglia's not looking too good, huh? So be it, my friend. So be it. Anything over here? Nope, not yet. That is fine. The Rabbit Dogs. Templar, G Garver, Gibbs, Baker. Their names are numerous, but there's one thing that unites them all. They were commissioned against commissioned generals in the Collaborationist Army. And now we have to judge them for the atrocities committed under the commands. They have no future in our army, and that much is clear. But how far do we want to punch them? Some are arguing that only blood can answer for blood, but others are arguing that a violent retaliation against these men is not is not who we are, and that more proportionate punishments should be considered. The trial of the field marshal. The field marshal strode into the court with his chef puffed out and his head held high, nodding respectively towards the judges and taking a seat beside the defense team. Uh, field marshal Bernard Montgomery, you stand here in front of all the people of England, accused of high treason against England and her people. How do you plead? Not 
guilty, his barrister announced. The defense team painted a stock picture before the jury, a picture of a brave and noble military man who fought in both world wars to defend his country, a picture of a soldier who sacrificed his pride and dignity to join the collaborators in hopes of preventing the German group from squeezing the life out of England. A picture of an Englishman who tried to serve his country. Montgomery had insisted to his team that he himself be called as witness and give a short but powerful speech regarding his duty as an officer to protect the English people in face of tyranny and evil, even if it means to sacrifice values you hold dear. The prosecution fought back against such claims, arguing that by sacrificing the values of liberty and democracy, Montgomery failed to protect the English people. The jury naturally is quite split. The following cloud, those following cloud in the NDL wish for the veteran to be sent into exile, while supporters of the SLP want to see him properly punished with a sentence of forced labor. Those sympathetic to Sterling, however, have argued for his death. Let him spend the rest of his days, contemplative days, in shameful exile. Death is only the face for traitors. And then forced labor should change his mind, pomposity. Or changes pomposity. A fascist fate. Chesterton faced the guilty sentence with a deathly silence and a blanched face. He was escorted directly to the hanging cell, and as a miserable visage of the gallows came into view, his legs collapsed beneath him. The guards caught the pale man under the shoulders and dragged him forwards. They placed him on the wooden scaffold, and his rapid breathing quickened ever more. Wrapped a white bag over his head and a thick rope around his neck, the young priest, clutching a Bible, gently asked for the Lord to forgive the trembling old man for his sins. Someone called out for Chesterton to give his last words. I hope that England follows me. His voice, his sentence was cut off by the sudden drop, but the rope was too short to snap his neck. Chesterton's body jerked side to side as he struggled for air, his legs kicking aimlessly. The minutes passed, the kicking subsided, and the fascist finally swayed in silence. Let English fascism die with him. The reformist. Harold Macmillan, the Chancellor and under treasurer of His Majesty's Exchequer, and the head of the revision reformist wing of the Royal Party. Well known for his stance towards softening the collaborationist government and allowing a larger degree of freedom, and his convictions apparently were not enough to overcome the fear of German intervention. And now he awaits punishment for being a wartime minister in Douglas Holmes' cabinet. Macmillan, Super Mac, is not like the other prominent defenders of the cabinet, however. Unlike Holm, he has never been in a position where he was responsible for the horrible crimes of the government. And unlike Chesterton, he is not a terrible and shameless individual who truly believes in the objective right of what he was doing. Perhaps that will allow him to avoid their fate. Perhaps not. We shall see as we shall conclude this episode and tomorrow we will have the slp leading us after we vote to get more in glucosia but if you enjoyed today's episode leave a like subscribe if you're new check out my discord link in the description below and i will see you tomorrow as we will make england quite quite a place thanks for watching have a great rest of your day